Tommy here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about how to set up OpenVPN and PFSense here in May of 2023. I've done this video before, but I want to do it with a modern twist in terms of what are the new ciphers that are offered compared to when I did my previous videos and how do those affect performance or which ones should you be using. And for the most part, this is going to be pretty simple in terms of setting up because I'm going to limit it in scope to local users. But if you're interested in how to do things like Radius Server, I have videos on that topic linked down below. But when you get to the cipher part, hey, you can use this video for reference for that because everything else is going to be the same. First, we're going to cover how to set up PFSense server, and then we'll cover how to set up the clients for both Windows and Linux on this to be able to get things imported and get other devices connected. It's pretty straightforward to do. Now, I have covered the topic of overlay networks and other types of networks design and those videos are also linked down below because that's a popular topic those weren't available or weren't as widely popular when i did my previous video so i think they're worth mentioning because there's different ways to approach this we're going to focus just on the open vpn approach which does mean you need a public ip and i'm going to be doing this in pf sense which is a release candidate right now of 2305 but there's not really anything different if you're using the 2301 or even the 2.6 or even the 2.7 of ce so whether you're using ce or pf sense plus doesn't really matter. The only thing CE offers over plus one in terms of OpenVPN is the data channel offload DCO, which is a really neat feature. It's currently marked as experimental here in May of 2023. So it's not something I'm going to talk about using, but hey, there's a link down below where you can read the blog post or you can do a little Googling and learn more about what data channel offload is and why it's pretty cool. Now, before we get into the video here, I do want to thank a sponsor and that sponsors me. If you'd like to hire us for a project, whether it's network consulting, engineering, or anything related to many of the things you've seen on this channel, head over to our website, lawrencesystems.com, click that hires button at the top, and it's greatly appreciated. Now let's jump into how to set this up in PFSense. Now, the first step we're going to do is go over here to system, package manager, and we want to make sure we have the open VPN client export utility loaded. If for some reason you don't have it loaded, you can just go over here to the available packages and add it. This makes it substantially easier to export all the settings into a client after you have open VPN set up. Then we're going to go over here to OpenVPN. From here, we're going to go over to the wizard and we'll just be using local user access. So we click next. Certificate authority. I have my LTS demo certificate authority in here. If you'd like to add your own self-signed CA, you absolutely can. We're going to hit next. We're also going to use this same certificate that I already have. Once again, if you want to add a new certificate that's signed by the certificate authority you created, go ahead and do that. And now we're going to start filling this out. Description, YouTube demo VPN sounds good. UDP. UDP is faster than TCP, but it is an option if you want to be able to use TCP on this. But UDP is going to be the preferred. It's going to be a faster VPN. Interface. If you have multiple interfaces, you could choose this, such as multiple WAN, but we're just going to leave it at WAN here. A local port of 1194. I'll leave it at default, but obviously this is easy enough to type in and change. TLS authentication. Yes, you want to enable authentication TLS, generate a new TLS key automatically generates a shared TLS authentication key. You don't have to fill anything in here. It'll do that for you. TH parameter length, 2048. That is perfectly fine. Next, data encryption algorithms. Now, I don't want to get too far out of scope on this, but ChaCha20 Poly 1305 is a stream cipher versus AES, which is a block cipher, and thus offers better performance for devices that do not have AENSI hardware acceleration. It can be considered also a bit more secure than AES based encryption because the use of lookup tables makes it vulnerable to siloed cache timing attacks on systems that don't have AES&I hardware. Now, if you want more information, I'll link to a computer file video down below where they really dive deep into ChaCha20 Poly 1305. And AES&I is not by any measure insecure, but if you have a client, and this is not just talking about server, when you negotiate an encryption algorithm with OpenVPN, one side is the client, one side's the server, and they both have to be using the same ciphers. So the AES&I acceleration you may have on your hardware in terms of PFSense may not be available to the client, so you will have some performance limitations. But of course, it's important that your PFSense have adequate hardware to support the number of users. So it still may make more sense because you're not worried about the individual user speed. Your individual users are only going to use so much bandwidth versus the aggregate of all the users. It may be better to choose either one. So either one is still secure. You're not causing an insecure issue, but I will mention ChaCha Poly 1305 was chosen for WireGuard and a lot of other modern systems because it's a really good cipher to use and there's no risk at all of using it inside of PFSense. So it's the one I'm going to recommend, but you can still use the other ones if you want. 
Now you can choose multiple as another option. And for example, if you chose both of these, the system would negotiate which one it wants to use. And then you would have a fallback of one of the other ones. I'm gonna leave it at Cha Cha Poly. Matter of fact, we'll just take out AES because I'm just not gonna use it, but you just hold the control key and select all the ones that you find relevant. These three are the recommended, but as I noted, OpenVPN has been around for a long time, so they have some of these ciphers. Some of them probably really shouldn't be used because they're so old. Next is our auth digest algorithm, and we want that to be SHA-256. That's perfectly fine. It's secure. Hardware crypto, if you have it. And as I said, I'm using Cha-Cha Poly, so this won't really matter, but we can just leave it here. It doesn't hurt to do this, leave it at the crypto engine that we have in here. IPv4 tunnel network. It is very important you choose a tunnel network because these are the IPs that are going to be assigned the tunnel IPs to the clients you have coming in. That means it should not ever overlap with your clients' networks. Common client networks are, for example, 192.168.0 or 1.1. You want to make sure you do something like 192.168.169 and anything that's uncommon. So you really could put other ranges here. And I'm going to do a slash 24, which leaves us plenty of room to have many clients on this system. Next is redirect IPv4 gateway. Now IPv4 gateway redirect means send all traffic through the tunnel. This may be something you want, but usually isn't because if people have a lot of different apps open, such as YouTube, Spotify, et cetera, things that they may be watching, streaming services, that means all that traffic's coming over there too from the client. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe you don't have the bandwidth to be able to support that. Uh, that is kind of a design consideration you need, but this is essentially the difference between split tunnel or checking this means full tunnel. Split tunnel means only access the resources that we've pushed. Speaking of resources that we've pushed, IPv4 local networks. These are the local networks attached to your PFSense. So we have this network here. If we had another network, and we'll just put it like at a different range, 10, 10, maybe 10, 10, 10, 0, you'd put each one of these in a comma and a space. And these are any of the local subnets that are attached to your PFSense that you want to have pushed as a option for the clients to route traffic back over to. Concurrent connections, we're going to leave that blank. Refuse any non-stub compression. That is the most secure. And this talks about compression tunnels uh, and the problems you can have where you're trading bandwidth for the potential security risk because compression creates prediction in terms of what the data might be. So I'm not going to dive too far off topic on that, but that's an interesting type of attack on there, but we'll leave this disable compression. I don't want any inter-client communication, so allow communication with clients can server. If you have a use case for it, you can turn it on. Generally, you don't. Allow multiple concurrent connections from the clients using the same common name. This is generally not recommended, but needed for some scenarios. It's actually an interesting problem you run into is if you do allow the duplicate connections, you may want that because if a user drops and tries to reconnect until it drops on the server side, there's a delay in letting them connect. So you can say limit the number from the same user to two, for example. That way, if they have a connection drop or switch networks and they haven't expired their session, they don't have to wait maybe a minute or two for that to expire. I would say definitely yes on dynamic IP, allow connected clients retain their connections to their IP address changes. That's fine. If you have special DNS that you would like to push to them, for example, if they're connecting in and you're expecting them to connect to your Active Directory and you need them to use your Active Directory server's DNS, you would then put the IP addresses of those DNS servers here. And then you have Win servers if you're still using those. I'm not, so we're next. Definitely, we want to add the firewall rule and definitely want to add the rule. Allow traffic connected clients to pass inside the tunnel. Add a rule to permit connections to this OpenVPN server instance where anywhere on the internet. So next and finish. Now the VPN is set up. Now, before we start using this, let's edit the server and talk about the server mode. We have the option of remote access user auth. We have remote access SSL TLS plus user auth. Let me explain the difference. OpenVPN server mode, SSL TLS plus user auth or remote access user auth makes it sound, if you don't read all the details, that you're just not verifying certificates if you use user auth, and that's not how that works. It's a little bit more complicated, so let's explain it. If you want to use a per user certificate, that is where you have SSL TLS plus user auth. If you just want user auth, but still verify those certificates that we created to attach to our VPN server, that still works. If you're just using the user authorization, it still has to verify those certificates that are embedded in the config file from when we created the OpenVPN server. So you're probably wondering, well, what's the advantage of a per user certificate? 
Well, the way this would work, and let's walk through an attack scenario that this protects against. So we have user one, user two, user three, and we first are just using user auth. We create an open VPN config file. We put it on each one of these users' systems. It allows them to remotely access. So the system's going to verify that they have the certificates that we created, that TLS key and the actual CA cert, the self-signed one. And it says, yes, you have both of those. What's your username and password? If they do not have one or the other or either one of those, it says, nope, I will not get you a username and password. Well, if you use the TLS auth plus user auth, that means we're going to ask for a third certificate. So we're going to take the user one's certificate, give them an install file that contains all three of these certificates in there. And if user one gets compromised in their system, maybe someone got that OpenVPN config file off there, we can create a certificate revocation list in PFSense. Then we can revoke that user's certificate, not delete it. Revoke it is specifically how you do this. And you attach it to OpenVPN with revocation. And then the OpenVPN server goes, nope, that certificate is now on the revocation list. Therefore, that user can't log in. Let's play a scenario out if you're just using user user auth. You've given all three of your users exactly the same file. One user gets compromised. You now have to regenerate a certificate for everybody because now anyone who has a copy of that file, there's no way to get rid of it. You can delete it off of OpenVPN, but you're doing it for all three users simultaneously because they're all using exactly the same config file. So this allows you to create a per user config file that will be revocable through the revocation system in PFSense. So it's not necessarily more secure in terms of like the encryption layer itself. It's just a further safety net. So if you had a hundred users rolled out and a user gets their system compromised and someone's able to lift that OpenVPN config file off their system, you don't have to redeploy a hundred users new VPN config because you just revoke the one certificate that was compromised and assigned to that user. The downside of course is managing certificates for every individual user becomes a different challenge, but it's worth noting that's how that system works. Now, since I left the system requiring that certificate, Certificate. We're going to go ahead and edit the user Tom here, and we can say, let's add a certificate for Tom. So we'll just hit add. And all this is fine, and we'll just call it as the common name Tom's cert. Scroll down here at the bottom, hit save. And now this user has a cert. Now, if we go back over here, we see we have Tom2, and who's belongs to no groups. You don't need, because we're using local user authentication, any privileges for this user to log into PFSense. So just here as a way to authenticate against so we can set them up in OpenVPN. You notice currently there's no certificate and I want to show what the difference is here. We go over here to OpenVPN, we go to client export. With client export, there's our client Tom because Tom has a certificate, but I can't export Tom too because no certificate. So if we go back over here to the system and then users, we'll edit Tom too and we'll add a certificate for Tom2, give it a common name of Tom2, save. Now Tom2 has a certificate and we can see each one of these users. Now these users go away if we go back into OpenVPN, go here server, and if we change it just to this, back over to client export, and this eliminates the different users because it says no cert, but technically there's still certs in there. There's just not a per user cert. That's why it has no certificate name in here. I just wanna make sure that is not confusing. Download for most clients. Let's take a look at the client download. I won't spend too much time covering this in Linux, but essentially you can do sudo open VPN, the name of the file, enter the username, enter the password, and you'll see if it connects. Sequence completed, and now it's connected. We're able to actually ping things behind the device. And we can test that real quick by splitting the screen. We'll type in ping this IP address, which is behind that firewall. And if we hit control C to exit this, you can see it dropped. Now let's show how to get this going in Windows and we'll ping the same IP address for a demo. For simplicity, I'm just gonna log into my Windows machine here, go to the OpenVPN, client export, and now we're gonna choose the installer. So right here is our Windows installer. So we're gonna click this as a download. Now let's go ahead and run the installer. Then we go down here to the bottom and we can click connect. We can see this is the local IP of this device right here. But if we now type IP config now that we're connected, we can see the tunnel network. This is, works the same in Linux. I just didn't demonstrate that. And now we can ping that same IP address. And if we turn the VPN off, we'll go over here. If we 
disconnect it, you'll see that that ping stops. We are no longer able to ping it. Now, in terms of troubleshooting, we are obviously connecting fine, so there's no troubleshooting to do here, but make sure you take the time to look at the logs both here, whether it's your Linux client, your Windows client, start with the client logs to see if any of these errors are pertaining to why you can't connect. And if you go to status, system logs, OpenVPN, you can see that there's any log errors that you may have that are related to your problem here. Of note, for anyone wondering why there's so many errors, these are unrelated to this demo. This is because when I set up a new PFSense server, a other demo that I'm working on is still trying to connect to this and it doesn't exist anymore. So these are the type of handshake errors you get because it's trying to present the wrong certificate. And I can't quite express just how important it is that you take the time to look at the client and the server logs when you have a connection failing before you post in a forum. It'd be one of the first things people, and especially myself, ask is, where's the logs? You can't just say it didn't connect or it doesn't work without some little bit of research into the logs of why, because the why is pretty detailed out in the logs in PFSense or even on the client side. Nonetheless, I love hearing from you. Let me know your thoughts and comments on this and other videos. And if you want to have a more in-depth discussion about this, head over to my forums. It's a nice place to reach me, engage with me, and dive into some of the particulars and maybe argue about ciphers because I have a feeling there's going to be some opinions on that little piece there. Nonetheless, check out the rabbit holes. You can go down the computer files. Awesome for explaining Cha Cha Poly. That's why I left a link to them down below so you can get a better understanding of how that cipher works. Like and subscribe is always appreciated. It really helps out the channel and lets you know that there's more content coming and lets you get notified of it. Hopefully YouTube's not the best at that, but it, it, it at least gives a suggestion that they should do it. Thank you for watching and I'll see you over in the forums. Take care.